the presentation today um, is sort of looking at the middle fleet of existing stores. So this is not the stuff that's been recently renovated or constructed and it's not looking at the stuff that's ready for major renovation. We're sort of looking at that middle of the road existing fleet. We're going to talk about um, the, the opportunities as well as the opportunity to finance um, some of the opportunities that um, exist from an energy efficiency standpoint. I'm going to hand that piece off to, uh, to Nick when we get to it. Um, so we thought for anybody who wanted to just rush out and say they'd attended the presentation, we'd begin with a little executive summary of what you're going to learn from all of this. Um, but essentially we're going to be talking about the energy opportunities, that journey to energy excellence. Um, we've got a couple of uh, case study example pieces at the back end on some projects we've worked on with Emerson. Um, and the middle piece will be Nick talking about um, the history of ESCOs and the market and the opportunity in uh, grocery stores. Um, <clears throat> a few different pieces to start off with. First of all, some industry highlights just to kind of set the scene on that piece. Then uh, how to do your journey to energy excellence, um, the ESCO, and then those examples, as I said. So starting with some industry highlights, this is probably not new to everybody. There's a lot of this information out there from various different groups. But you know, the, uh, the key to all of this is that we're talking about a $682 billion industry that's only making just over 1% of, uh, of after-tax profit. Um, there are 38,000 locations. Mean store size, about 41,000 square feet. Average store uh, size, um, sorry, the median store size is about 41,000. The average is about 50. The pressures on the industry, it's talked about regularly. Um, margins are thin. There's a lot of e-commerce coming in. Um, there's talk about European discounters wanting to enter the North American market. And there's a move for reducing uh, debt on balance sheets. From an energy standpoint, um, I'm not sure how familiar people are with just how energy intensive grocery stores, supermarkets are, um, but they rank right up there in the community, uh, maybe only outpaced by ice rinks. Um, $4 a square foot from an operating cost, that's a combination of 50 kilowatts a square foot for um, the electricity side and about 50 cubic feet of natural gas per year. Um, that means your average 50,000 square foot store is consuming something in the order of 200,000 um, dollars of uh, utility cost and um, Energy Star and uh, NREL have both done various studies on this. Um, the combination of HVAC and refrigeration can represent as much as 70% of that cost and there's an opportunity for about a 30% plus or minus reduction in that space. So what that ultimately, ultimately means is it's a significant reduction in cost. And when you consider that a dollar of energy savings equates to $59 of added revenue, tens of thousands of dollars of energy savings equates to hundreds of thousands of dollars of additional sales. Put those two pieces in perspective. Again, talking about the opportunity. So if you take those 38,000 stores at their 50,000 square feet and the $4 a square foot for energy, we're talking about an average energy cost per year of about $7.7 billion. Looking at the reduction, there's an average energy saving of $1.6 billion. That's that interest piece now for um, essentially being able to bring financing into all of this. So over a seven-year finance contract, there'd be $11.5 billion of savings that are achieved. And looking at an average of, say, a $75,000 cost for um, store upgrades, $2.89 billion worth of business opportunity to be done. The next piece is to talk about the journey to energy excellence, what it is and how do you do that. Challenges and opportunities in the space. I think lack of actionable data and the focus on business as usual is probably the piece that drives the biggest opportunity in all of this. Um, a lot of the, um, the process around who does this, who executes on it, is it a maintenance activity, is it a construction activity, that posts challenges as well. Um, accessing capital. Uh, we see on a regular basis, we're told capital is not an issue until you're trying to move a project forward and it's delayed a year or two because of those complex internal approvals that are necessary. 
Um, so all of this leads to the, that opportunity for a turnkey solution that includes a finance package. It uses the current vendors who service a location. So you build the opportunity, you work with the existing hands-on people, you provide the financing with guaranteed savings. It's a package that's been offered in many other industries. It doesn't exist today really in food retail. Effective and efficient, the two sort of words that uh, play a big part in all of this. You'll see as we move along a little bit here. So from a definition perspective, um, capacity, um, sorry, effectiveness is your capability to deliver what you need to deliver basically. So more commonly, does it make cold since most of the energy is in cooling and refrigeration here? Yep, we're great. From an efficiency standpoint, this is, you know, how do you get maximum efficiency um, with the least amount of effort? So um, rolling the ball along, same amount of effort, you're getting further ahead. The reality though is, I don't know, I don't care, just leave me alone. Energy is still a piece that is not talked about. Um, the efficiency, the focus is, is rightly on effectiveness because it is about maintaining temperatures and being able to make sure that, that the, the food um, um, quality is maintained. But you can still do that and be um, energy efficient as well as effective. So the discussion on that stems from this is looking at energy efficiency against time. The little black dot represents the start of a particular concept. It could be the renovation, the construction, could be a system, could be a whole store. Um, but at that particular point in time, there's an efficient technology or the most efficient technology that exists. You then go through a design and a procurement and an installation and adjustment and ongoing maintenance. So today you end up with still an effective system, but you've already lost some of the potential for energy savings that existed in what you picked at the beginning. Now, the opportunity to get some of that back exists through doing optimization and doing recommissioning work. We could also have discussion about doing a complete retrofit, removing everything that's in there and putting in the very latest technology. Um, which may have much better controls and electronic valves and all of the things that the industry has seen developed um, over the last years. The more common reality is that there are just some capital upgrades that can be done as well that improve the operation of the system um, so you get part way to the best technology. And the last piece to all of that is then some sort of ongoing performance monitoring because you want to make sure that you don't end up degrading those savings that you've achieved over a period of time. So to now talk about the opportunity um, for the reduction of energy. So if you take time and the consumption, we sit today at the top. The first step in this journey to energy excellence is your baseline. You've got to be able to understand what you're currently using and help identify what the opportunities are, what the hurdles are that you potentially have to get through. It also helps develop that ESCO contract because you're now looking at what the baseline is, what the target is, and what the costs are in between. Usually the next step in it is to look at refrigeration since it's the biggest chunk. Um, so this could be new controls, it could be VFDs, um, floating head, you could be looking at the cases, um, case controllers. Um, and then some of the new opportunities that have been talked about today, whether you can get into some of the thermal stories or storage or batteries um, as well, because here we're talking about combining effectiveness and efficiency together. Next opportunity, of course, HVAC, again, VFDs, demand control ventilation. So, you know, what's your current setup? Um, are you overventilating? Uh, it's, it's a common occurrence uh, that, that we overventilate everything. Um, lighting may not be step four because it may already have been done. Sometimes that's the low hanging fruit that's been done, but of course, it's not always the case. And then the last discussion could be around some of those new technologies or renewables. And then again, we're back now into this. You're now at your uh, optimum energy efficiency, you've reached your energy excellence, and now you want to sustain that through some sort of monitoring-based continual commissioning um, to sustain those. Part of this discussion as well is the, the, the asset life, um, the, the opportunity to predict failure, prevent failure. All of those things are often not talked about because they're not tangible, they're not measured. We, we often talk about ROIs being strictly based on the energy saving that's been created. But often when you're creating that energy saving, there are a whole number of other benefits that come from it. How do you get baseline? 
Um, again, there's been a lot of discussion in this space. Um, this is just one example, but the ability to log data is becoming extremely easy to do and very cost effective. Um, energy data is one of the things that you need, and ideally you need to be moving to granular data where you're looking at the actual devices. You're not necessarily looking at the utility meter. Um, it doesn't get you enough um, information quickly enough to start to realize that some of the things you're doing are actually having a benefit. And if you can't sustain the excitement about where you're driving to, sometimes these things kind of lose, um, lose momentum. Once you've got that energy data, what are you going to do with it? Um, there are a couple of things that are important. One is a weather normalized power profile. So a weather normalized power profile is creating essentially what is your kilowatt hour consumption at each ambient condition that is occurring. Um, so you know that at each degree um, that's occurring, if you measure your kilowatt hour consumption and you continually average those, you can produce a fairly accurate power profile for a system. And that then gives you the ability to duplicate exactly the same data pre and post and be able to demonstrate the difference between the two lines um, is essentially the savings that have been created in the system. And this, again, it's a measured saving in the system. Um, so actually, it's a kilowatt reduction, but the reality is that it's a derived kilowatt, not a measured kilowatt. The other tool that can be used is system efficiency indexing. Um, SEI was developed about six or seven years ago as a collaboration between the VDMA in Germany and the IOR in the UK. Those are their governing bodies, similar to, similar to ASHRAE. And what they were trying to do was come up with an independent measure, independent of ambient measure, that allowed you to look at system performances. So traditional COPs and EERs being dependent on weather, the number itself has no meaning unless you actually do the calculation to know if your EER of 12 is good or bad, depending on what's happening. When you move to SEI, your SEI should be unchanged regardless of what ambient temperature is at because it is actually the ratio between your theoretical Carnot COP and your actual operating COP. So um, you do, of course, get some degradation as you get to the outer limits of, so as you get to some really high ambience, you sometimes see a little bit of kind of degradation. But we've been finding that a lot of the mid-range performance um, is, is extremely accurate when you use this as a measure. Um, and it allows you to compare two systems um, just by that SEI number. How do you use this? I'm just going to touch on that monitoring-based continual commissioning piece. Um, so one of the opportunities, if you've got that weather normalized power profile, is you can look at what weather occurred in the last seven days, 30 days, or over the last year. And you can take what your consumption at those temperatures are to produce a predicted um, consumption. And then you compare that against your metered data. And if those two numbers are fairly close, you know that your system performance hasn't, uh, hasn't degraded in any way and that you're essentially sustaining those savings. I've got an example coming to, to show this. But here you can see the, uh, in this particular one, this is the predicted um, done as a calculation off that weather normalized power profile. This is the actual metered data, the difference between the two. If it's within an acceptable range, you know that nothing is, nothing's been done to the system. So uh, this is an example using SEI. Um, so here you can see that this is the overall system SEI and the subsystem efficiencies. So I'm going to get an alert because the SEI for the system has degraded. One of the interesting things is that because of how this combined SEI is calculated, I know automatically that the system has a condensing issue because the system boundaries here are what are generating this alert. What's interesting in this example is that at this particular point in time, there were no control-based alarms coming out of the system because it was still delivering the required amount of cooling. So it starts to become that ability to also predict that you've got an issue that's occurring in a system. Now, I can't tell you what's causing this. You know, it, I don't know if it's a fan issue, uh, if it's a garbage bag that's blown up onto the unit, but you do know where to start troubleshooting, and you also know when the problem's been corrected. So this is another example of the same uh, information. So you can see here that the annual consumption, it's bang on 100% of what's predicted. You can see that the, between the, the pre and post optimized profiles, the gap's been maintained, energy savings has been sustained um, for the whole course of the year. Other than this small little alert piece here where you can clearly see the consumptions jump back to the old profile. 
And you can see in the last 30 days that the consumption is up 6 or 7%. Having restored it, last week, the last seven days, it's slightly less than 100% of predicted. All of this relates to that condenser issue that was shown in the previous slide. So it's, it's interconnected. But having this sort of level of, of data and information is what allows you to find the savings, prove the savings, finance what you have to do, and then make sure that you sustain them going forward. Thanks, Darren. So talking about ASCOs, there are a couple of definitions out there, and here we name it energy savings companies. Some other definitions state as energy service companies. It is speaking to the same concept. Here we're focusing on, on savings, so we decided to roll with this one. And when evaluating savings, we need to understand is there economics that are attractive to enough to the companies to pursue those projects. So McKinsey, who is the global consulting powerhouse, states that on average it's about 17% rate of return. So that could seem low, that could seem high, there are ranges around it, but let's just stick with this number for a while. And to determine whether it's good or not, we need to compare it to two things. One is your cost of capital, and the second one is what other investment opportunities are out there. So Finance 101 tells us that if you can make more money than you spend on doing the project, then you should implement the project. But if there are multiple projects out there, how do you decide which one you implement? And we looked at small caps, large caps, corporate bonds, Canada savings bonds, we're from Canada, so we have those, um, and cash. And it's interesting to see how not only energy savings projects are typically um, higher return than most of the other uh, investment opportunities, they're also lower risk. So if I wanted to have something in my investment portfolio, I would definitely consider those type investments. Now, when we switch in talking to end customers, we typically see that statement thrown around quite quickly to make the decision very hard yes or very quick no. So is there payback more or less than one year? And a lot of people make decisions based on that rule. That's very limiting. And when you look at 17% per year return or one year payback, how do you compare the two? And in that regard, we've done a little bit of a comparison, just to a quick math to show that on a 10 year project, the typical investment opportunities will give you the four to eight year payback, which doesn't mix into the one year rule quite easily. So how do you go about bringing something that's still very economically um, positive and efficient, and yet it just doesn't it just doesn't bode well with something that's been around for, for years, such as the one year rule. Now, those are the economic reasons, and there are plenty of them to be considered, but there are also other reasons out there to consider energy savings projects. This morning, we've heard about different jurisdictions and how they start and increase the number of regulations, incentives, and goals for the energy efficiency manners. Two weeks ago, UN um, came out with a report that says we've got 12 years to deal with this climate catastrophe that's coming, and that's, that's a pretty powerful statement, but drilling into the micro level, what's in it for me, for the store owners, for the equipment manufacturers, and just like Darren said, the more efficient equipment and, and well-maintained equipment has longer life, and it also reduces the risk of failure, which is, which is a huge component in the uh, supermarket industry. In terms of the barriers to, uh, to implementing those projects, Johnson's Controls done this study a while ago, so it outlines 11 different reasons, and not surprisingly, capital budget is the clear winner there. But what's even more surprising is that out of 11, the vast majority, which is six, are purely financial, and top three are all financial reasons right here. So that brings us to the ASCOs and what they actually do and how they structure to help handle some of those risks and some of those barriers. And definition from the DOE states that energy savings, energy savings or energy service companies they're basically a project manager that develops energy savings projects and help finance them through the performance contracting. And then we go on to, to define the performance contracting whereby it's the contract where the ESCO guarantees that a minimum amount of savings are achieved. And then there's a structure that allows that ESCO to finance all the uh, upfront equipment cost through those savings over the years of, of the contract life. Some of the services that are offered through the energy service companies are well known, so I'm not gonna go through the whole list, but the key ones are to be able to um, 
to engage the financier who understands the technology risks, who can take on that risk and guarantee the savings in the end, because if there is a shortfall in, if, and the savings are not actually achieved, then that guarantor makes up the difference. So if that guarantor has troubles understanding and not managing that risk, they'll be out of business very quickly. Another piece to it is understanding all the incentives that are available in the particular jurisdictions because that helps the financing and the economics of the project quite significantly. And jurisdictions vary quite a bit in, in terms of that knowledge and understanding that is key. Another thing uh, that helps us understand and manage the risks about, mentioned above is definitely real-time management and verification that Darren just talked to us about. In terms of the parties, ESCOs typically work with the establishment relationships that supermarkets already have in place, such as the operations and management teams, equipment manufacturers, distributors, and so on. The key parties, of course, here are the customer and the ESCO, and then the guarantors who steps in to provide those, those guarantees. So it looks like a pretty tight structure. There's a lot of benefits that help address the barriers that we talk about, but it basically boils down to the question where Darren comes in and does the business system audit, provides um, a list of recommendations how to achieve those savings, and then the next question is, hey, when can we start? And, and today is November, so almost November, so that means the 2019 budgets are all spoken for. That means Darren has to come back at the end of 2019 to try to get a spot in the 2020 budget, so we're talking two years of non-action, and you could have been saving those energy costs for two years already. So, this structure allows to do that because there's no requirement for debt, there's no requirement for on prem capital. The savings are guaranteed, and within that structure, that, also, that financing also becomes the um, off balance sheet, which is, which is an important consideration for financials. In, that same, in the same aspect, to be able to do all that, ASCO also takes over all the technology and implementation risk, including project management and the actual equipment uh, replacements. So the bottom line is your cash flow positive from day one, and I think that's a very powerful statement. So this is just to show that the ASCO structure that we're discussing here, it's, it's not a brand new concept. It's been accepted around the world. The numbers are quite dated, but they just show the relative size of the market. And in the US, the structure has been around for decades since the 70s, and the biggest catalyst it was in 1992, where the Energy Policy Act authorized the government agencies to use private financing for energy efficiency projects. Most of the ESCOs are operating as a subsidiary of equipment manufacturers, and sometimes that's being handled as well at the utility level in the same fashion. And then some of the other um, ways that ESCOs are structured are either just on a standalone basis or engineering firms do that as well, such as Darren. This slide just speaks to quite a few things, but I'll try to break it down in components of, this is the basic structure, and then the next slides talk about the steps of implementation as well as just the graphic representation of what, how the savings are split. So the key here is that the end user just deals with the NASCO. So it's a one counterparty, it's a one-stop shop. The energy savings performance contract is signed. So here, ESCO is guaranteeing the savings and providing a bunch of different services, which we'll dive into next slide. And in return, the end user um, agrees to share those savings with ESCO on some sort of proportionate basis. And then it's up to the ESCO to engage the lender, the financial institution, to have the financing, engage all the facilitators, such as the third party service providers, consultants, audits and, and whatnot, equipment installers, and, and, and the list goes on. So here are the actual steps where Darren would, or another in, uh, engineering company would come in, would uh, do a business system audit, a building system audit, um, establish management and verification process, collect the baseline de data, that would allow him to put together a list of recommendations, and based on those recommendations, the contract is signed between the NASCO and the end customer, so that once the ESCO organizes everything and implements the, uh, the project, the savings starts trickling in. There's a management and verification process that verifies that the actual savings have been achieved. Then those savings are being shared between the end customer and the ESCO to pay out all the services costs, including financing, and after the term of the contract is done, then the end customer is left with the same equipment and all, all the project that all the project remains in place and the end customer gets to enjoy 100% of the savings. And this is just the graphic representations of what I've just talked about and the horizontal axis talks about 
the time versus the energy cost. So first we're starting with this amount of energy costs and after the project is implemented, those are getting reduced while the savings which are in green and in red are being shared for the over the contract term um, with an ESCO. Now this graph was just pulled from another government agency and it's just a representation. It's not, we don't have any figures, we don't have any percentages because a lot of it is customizable per project. So here it looks like, I don't know, maybe 10% is, is getting to the end customer versus 90% goes to ESCO. It could be 50-50, it could be 60-40, it's all case-based. That's the, that's the term of the con average term of the contract because there's a finance piece in there, so that's, that, that's how the payback gets affected. And as you can see here, there's no spike of initial outlay of the capital, which would increase the cost. So from day one, once the project is implemented, your costs drop right away. So we spoke about how to implement it on the one store basis. One store is great, but we all know that each store is different. There are different locations that uh, imply different cost measures, incentives, layouts, and things like that. So the approach on the chain wide, which is the preferred approach, is much the same. The, step, the steps are pretty much the same as I described before, but the key component is starting with a group of representative stores. So maybe it's a handful, maybe it's a dozen different geographies just to prove the concept. And once the pr concept is proven, then the rollout is, is easier. That also allows for standardization of the uh, contractual documents. It's quite heavy document base, or it could be. So to simplify the process, the centralized approach is very much appreciated and, and it allows for economies of scale. We all know this guy, and recently he's got in trouble for saying that the funding was secure. That was a big risk for him. He took it and didn't work out for him. And ASCO takes the risk of saying, hey, I'm guaranteeing the savings. So the key question for the ASCO is, are the savings really there? So have they really been achieved? And that's when, again, the real-time measurement and verification addresses that risk and allows the ASCO to actually step in and guarantee those savings. This is the conclusion of the ASCO slide, but basically it's been around for decades. It's very well received in other industries, but maybe not so much. So why so? And there are a couple of good reasons for it. One is, one is psychology, and that one is kind of pretty, pretty common. And a lot of people say, well, it just sounds too good, too good to be true. Is there a problem with it? Is there a cash? Is it a, is it a scam? Well, just try it. Get one store rolling and see how it works out. It's all guaranteed, so what do you have to lose? That's one aspect of it. The other one is completely opposite of it. It's like, wow, that's such a great idea. Why don't we do it ourselves? Well, then 17 to 20 people from different levels of decision making starts getting involved. Those calls get pushed out week after week. So to get concentrated expertise in each sector that needs to be mastered to put together a program like this becomes a long time horizon and quite complex to implement so that in that regard, it just takes time and there is no action. And that means lost savings. And then the last point here is the product push. Because a lot of ESCOs are based out of equipment manufacturers, then some of the customers could get concerned that it's just another sales tactics. And to that effect, ESCO operates with a variety of equipment and service providers. So there's enough choice there to make sure that the correct configuration is presented and implemented. On the supermarket chain, we spoke about the challenges of store-specific details. We talked about how head office decisions could be a bit slow. And then from the financial aspect of it, there's not a lot of financiers that would be able to, to look at that in an efficient manner because typical upfront investment, Darren mentioned on average $75,000, it's not a lot of money. Most people like signing big checks so it's done and dusted. While working with supermarkets and these kind of problems takes a lot of expertise in standardizing the process financial aggregation, which means you take a lot of small loans and small payouts and aggregating into big chunks, so it becomes economic efficient. And again, somebody who can do it should be able to do this financial aggregation quite, um, quite efficiently themselves. And on the back end of it, understand the technology that stands behind those savings that drives those savings upwards. And it could be a challenge to, to select somebody who's got both of those things done. And all of that leads to economies of scales, which I think everybody appreciates. So in the end, what ASCOs provide, they're basically a one-stop solution for, for your energy savings at zero upfront cost, cash flow positive from day one. Uh, I was involved in really hundreds of millions of dollars worth of opportunity in this area. To say ESCO is not widespread, I would say that's not true. It mm. is true in the food retail market. Right. But in other aspects and in other industries, that's an everyday occurrence. It's mm -hmm. an everyday business. 
So I think it's quite interesting that uh, I'd like to hear from some of our future customers why they haven't gone down this path. Because the risk is low. In fact, the risk is zero from that standpoint. Yes, it might sound too good to be true, but it is true. You know, if two companies engage in that process, there is relatively zero risk from that standpoint. This is fascinating because I've seen it work in many, many, many different industries right. on very large projects. Tens of millions of dollars for the size of projects. But why, why not here? Yeah. Yeah, so I think in, in the bottom part of that slide, we hit on a couple of points there. But it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, and I agree with you. I mean, the structure's been around for forever. What if you don't get your reduction numbers? What happens after the contract period? The company's stuck with something that doesn't meet the numbers you gave them? Well, the, the risk is that it will get apparent right away, and ASCO, if, if ASCO continues to operate, that's not a sustainable business when you're losing year after year, a lot of money. So I think something like that would highlight a, I don't want to call it a glitch, but a problem in the system, which either would terminate the project and the ESCO would be liable for, the, uh, for all the difference, or otherwise reconfigure it so that it works in, in the future. I mean, when you take a look at it from a, risk, from a pure customer standpoint, mm -hmm. it's out there to the far right where it's green. Right. Because all their costs are covered. Right. Yeah. On the center. That's board. what I was asking about. What happens if you don't meet your targets yeah. and then the company assumes the risk after the company? Retail doesn't, doesn't take on that risk. But they're stuck with the system. Yes, still in the finance company, yes. They, they've absorbed that risk. But after the contract period, does the company, if they're not meeting the numbers that they agreed to, then they're, they're on their own. I think, I think it's typically addressed throughout those contracts because the contracts are quite specific and heavily negotiated. So I mean the termination clause and what happens after the contract runs out, I think it's one of the most important ones to be, to be considered. Where do you not look at the age of the equipment? So if you have an old store that has equipment that's, let's say 10 or 15 years old, do you still go in to that or do you not go after that type of age of equipment to store? It all depends. Or is the financing including upgraded new equipment? <laughs> yes, it, it is. It, it, it includes the retrofits that would be required to bring that store up to the current uh, optimized solution. We're actually, I love the discussion. We were hoping to answer the questions in the end. So yeah, that's good. No, no, keep going. It's good. I mean, I, I've seen ESCOs go in, and whether it's uh, the heating systems that are 50 years old or the roof or the window. Whatever is contributing to the uh, energy usage, um, they'll replace that part of it. The bill gets big, the savings may, may take longer, but whatever needs to be done can be included in that, in that process. I think the extreme of this could be an entire retrofit. Exactly. I, and, and it could still be done under the same model. The reality is that there is a large sector of relatively good, relatively well-maintained equipment that has opportunity to improve it from an operational and energy efficiency standpoint. So that's also part of this. It's, we're not limited to just looking at major renovations or, or you know, big projects. You can essentially pick up the whole gambit across the board from relatively straightforward ones through to much more complex ones. And I think that question answers one of your questions earlier, why not supermarkets? I think it's because of that widespread of different configurations. Stores been around for 15, 20 years versus two or three years. LED lighting is so, so many people do ASCOs on LED lighting. So you just swap them out and put the LED ones in. Well, you can't just do that in supermarket. Just that's very well you've explained. And with different equipment, especially, it becomes more complex. So last piece on this. Don't have an awful lot of time here, so I'm going to go pretty quickly through this. Uh, this is just some actual real-world examples um, of uh, projects that we've done. Um, these were projects done um, up in Canada, um, working with Amazon. Um, so initial project was a um, recommissioning for medium and low temperature racks. Um, this is uh, using that weather normalized data. Um, this type of recommissioning work we're typically seeing it represents something in the order of a 10 to 20 percent energy reduction. Um, it does involve some focused service and maintenance. This is not necessarily purely recommissioning on set points, et cetera. You may determine that um, you know, there, there is uh, some defective 
um, you know, pressure transducer that's got an offset, so you want to replace that. Um, this particular um, exercise um, resulted in about $3,500 of expense with the refrigeration contractor for doing some of the actual um, work on site. Um, we created an 18% energy reduction. Um, again, using this weather normalized power profile and the, the energy that's being logged, you can clearly see the, the improvements um, and the sustaining of those. One really interesting fact here was this little blip here and the jump back. This actually was the control system recommissioning that was done on a Thursday and a Friday, and there was a power cut on the Sunday, and the control system defaulted back to the original settings. It didn't save the ones that we'd spent time putting in. And after about a week of work um, on the control side, they figured out what hadn't saved correctly. But it was a good example of traditional recommissioning work without that monitoring-based continual commissioning would have meant that the savings lasted just a matter of days before everything went back to normal. So that's that whole sort of if you're not monitoring this, then you can't sh ensure that you sustain those savings. That's a key piece in this whole ESCO business because you've got to be able to demonstrate um, quite clearly that you're sustaining savings moving forward in order for the whole model to work and everybody to have the comfort in it. Uh, this is the, the same... Uh, um, the same project, just again, showing the actual savings from that weather normalized power profile. What the two lines represent actually is a day and night profile. Um, and because it's food retail and it's heavily uh, refrigeration, you don't see much of a deviation between this. If we were doing the same exercise on a you know, commercial office space, for example, you would typically see significant differences between the two profiles here and the two profiles here, but the difference between them would be the same. Uh, the next project that we looked at, um, through the thermodynamic analysis that we've been doing on the, the racks, we identified um, on, on actually the medium temperature and the low temperature rack that there was um, a compressor that was running hot. So that was identified as not just a digital upgrade kit onto it, but a complete compressor replacement. Um, so each of the racks then had a replacement of one of the, the compressors on the rack. And this is the, the measurement and verification data. So we had 223 days of baseline data and 69 days of post-project data. Um, we achieved a 15.8% energy reduction um, in the store through the, the actual um, uh, ability to vary the capacity on the rack with, with having that uh, digital discus compressor as the lead. Um, what was also interesting was that um, 4% of this actually came from the switch of the compressor. So before we activated the solenoid, we ran it first to see what the difference was between that failing old compressor and the new compressor and then enabled the, the digital piece. So um, this number, that's why we're talking about 10 to 16% here because depending on the condition of the equipment that you're upgrading, you get a variance in that piece. Uh, one of the other ones is the, uh, <laughs> the adiabatic cooling. Um, I'm sure lots of you have seen garden hoses and sprinklers on roofs in the middle of the summertime. Um, <laughs> we see marginally sized units. There's a lack of maintenance on those, those particular units. Um, but there's a significant amount of energy waste associated with it, particularly in the water. So running those hoses that are just sort of spraying everything and wetting the roof um, doesn't do a particularly great job um, for actually improving the performance of the condenser. You, getting wet areas and dry areas. Um, so in this particular instance, we uh, installed some misting nozzles um, in order to control um, the need for this adiabatic cooling. Um, we essentially set um, a contactor on the sixth fan so um, that it, we didn't want the misting system to be running if not all of the eight fans were necessary. And we set an ambient of 73 degrees. So if ambient was above 73 and six fans are running, the misting system uh, would then operate. Um, what was interesting from this was that uh, the, the water savings are huge. To put this in perspective, an Olympic-sized swimming pool is 2,500 cubic meters of water. So running that garden hose from June to September or May to September or October or even into November or December if you forgot to turn it off and froze your roof. Uh, massive amounts of water and water is one of those um, uh, utilities that is 
continuing to rise. We're typically seeing you know, a 10% rise in cost of, of water. You're also typically paying sewer charges for that water. So you're picking it up twice because it's, it's being assumed it's going down the drain and it's not. Um, also, obviously, um, if the condenser's performing better, the system performs better. So we had also recorded a 2,500 kilowatt hour per year saving. But essentially, this one comes from uh, the water savings in the system. And it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting concepts on how you, how you use all of these various, you know, technologies and when do you use them. Um, and a lot of opportunity lies in, there's a, there was a problem that, was, that occurred and somebody came up with some type of solution just to keep it working, but there's often a much better way of doing it if you can invest enough time and, and effort to research that. Uh, the last one, this was um, single 10 ton um, packaged units. Um, on a distribution center. Um, so this particular project involved um, electronic valve, uh, VFD on the condenser fans and on the compressor. Um, and that allowed the uh, condensing temperature to be re reduced from 95 to 60, so essentially floating the head um, outside of the, uh, the peak days. Um, believe it or not, this is a 48% annual energy reduction. Um, just huge energy savings. And this was replicated on a multitude of units. This, this data is just for one of them. Um, but these are the sort of opportunities that exist. And it actually took doing a unit and measuring all of the information to get the client interested in doing this. The, the pushback and the pushback of those savings aren't real went on and on and on. And it wasn't until this, pro this initial unit was done that the decision was made to do all of them and the project then rolled into, a, I think there were 46 units that were, uh, that were ultimately retrofitted with savings in the 20 to 50% or close to 50% range. Um, and then this is just one last slide. So of those first three projects um, together, uh, this is looking at that weather normalized power profile. So this was the original baseline and then using bin data you can project out the balance of that um, and then this is the uh, the low temperature after the VFD has been put on and this is after the recommissioning so you can see we went from here to here with recommissioning and here with the um, with the variable capacity on the compressor and again the last piece sustained savings so uh, 30 months um, of sustained savings no, no significant deviation. I mean, you see things here where stuff's offline, so you, there, there's sometimes a little bit of deviation, but essentially the old profile to the new profile is, is continually sustained because any deviation gets alerted to. So in conclusion, we've talked about this. The opportunities are real, the savings are real. Um, we're not doing anything that, that is really groundbreaking. This is not new technology. This is proven technology that you can actually utilize and implement in your systems. The ESCO part means that there's no upfront cash necessary, so we're now in a position to do this essentially as a turnkey with your preferred equipment supplier, with your preferred contractor, um, and without needing any money, so you're cash flow positive day one. Thank you. <laughs>